we have both council right here. And I have ladies. Okay. Mr. Brannick, I believe you represent uh, the appellant in this case. So I will ask you if you would like to reserve time for rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to reserve five minutes if I may. Not a problem. I will let you know as best I can without any causing undue interruption when we arrive at that point of your presentation, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. You may begin. Yeah, please, the court. I'm Steve Brannick of Brannick Berman Insider here representing the appellants, then therapeutics and its principles. The plaintiff appellees here purchased stock in then pursuant to an agreement containing a broad arbitration clause submitting, quote, all controversies concerning the agreement to arbitration. Plaintiffs later brought common law fraud and securities claims seeking to rescind those contracts. And we're here today because the trial court refused to send this case to arbitration pursuant to the party's agreement. I'll start with the obvious, or at least what has always seemed obvious to me, a lawsuit seeking to rescind an agreement and which is going to be all about the circumstances surrounding the negotiation of the agreement, the execution of the agreement, certainly concerns that agreement within the plain meaning of the arbitration provision. I think the case is as, uh, as simple as that. Uh, the court, I'm sure, is well familiar with the black letter law. Arbitration provisions are favored um, pursuant to this policy, all doubts are resolved in favor of arbitration, and one interprets the provisions of an arbitration agreement pursuant to their plain meaning, just like any other provision in any other contract. So several cases apply that black letter law, and I think are right on point. The leading case is a venerable old case of the Prima Paint case decided by the U.S. Supreme Court back in 1967. The plaintiff claimed a fraudulent inducement and sought rescission. It had a similar broad arbitration clause, sending all controversies to arbitration. The, the uh, Supreme Court ruled that plaintiff's fraud and rescission claims needed to be arbitrated, and Florida and Ohio cases are, are, uh, are in accord. Uh, the, this court has decided in the Stacey David case that uh, fraud and fedupta cases in a fraudulent inducement case are, are uh, subject to arbitration, even when rescission is sought. Uh, the 5th DCA reached the same decision in the Beezer case, the 4th in the Ronvat case, and then the 3rd in the brand new MP case that we just cited as supplemental authority. Now, the plaintiffs... Mr. Brandt, before we go too far into the argument, I'd like to make sure that we identify the operative language sense that we're all dealing with. This is not a contract that uses the terminology of a rising out of or anything similar to that. This contract in 13 basically says the parties agree to submit all controversies, which appears to be broad language. But it also says you have to look at the rest of 13. And 13F has the following language, which may arise between the parties, magic words, concerning this agreement. So is the operative word that we should focus on concerning? Absolutely. I think concerning this agreement and, is very much like the, the, the common right. language. And concerning this agreement, means about this agreement. Correct. Wouldn't Honor. that be a narrow construction? Uh, the, the trial court found that it was a, br a broad arbitration provision. We agree with that. The other uh, side hasn't contested that. And I think it's a very similar arbitration provision to the arbitration uh, provisions that were at issue. Well, in the cases you know, so, sometimes about. the judge can be right for the wrong reason. But my concern is if I have to, or this panel has to write an opinion, the word is concerning and using Webster's and others, that seems to define it as about, which seems to suggest that this is a narrow construction, or maybe you would take the position that even about means a broad construction. But I want to make sure we are dealing with the words that appear first in this contract and then see how they relate to some of the words that appear in the case law that has been used. Because um, it doesn't appear that this contract used that language and i want to i guess reason by analogy but first what does this contract mean in terms of english and since we've been told by our supreme court that we can look at contracts and statutes and use dictionaries i suspect that that works for this one too so my question is what does the word concerning how should we interpret it what does it mean 
And does that meaning register a narrow or a broad interpretation? I think it's a broad interpretation. It's a broad interpretation, but I don't know that we need to get tied up in an academic discussion of whether it's narrow or broad, because I think we have an easy case that this concerns the contract. And it concerns the contract in two basic ways. Once it concerns the contract, because it because necessarily a fraudulent inducement claim talks about the who the who said what to whom in the run-up to the contract, in the negotiations to the contract. That's the very reason that the court in the Prima Pay case and this court in the Stacey David case and the other cases that we talked about have suggested that fraudulent inducement claims are, uh, are uh, concerning the, the, the contract because they necessarily touch upon the contract. So that's one argument. The second argument we have, we have an even stronger argument in this case because there are a number of provisions in this contract that are clearly gonna be at issue, both in connection with the securities claims and in connection with the uh, fraudulent inducement claims. For example, as to the security claims, the agreement states that the securities will not be registered, that they are subject to an exemption, and the plaintiffs in the agreement represent that they are essentially sophisticated accredited investors, and thus registration will not be necessary. And as we talked about in our brief, if they are in fact accredited investors, then the securities laws don't ap apply here. The, 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 that this transaction would be exempt from the securities laws. Obviously, all of those provisions are going to be in play. So it's, impos it's impossible to litigate this case without reference to the contract, which is precisely the test that they've asked this court to uh, apply, which is does, does, if you're gonna be litigating this case, are you gonna have to talk about the contract? And clearly uh, the defense is gonna be talking about this contract all day long because it's gonna to point to those securities registration provisions and it's gonna to point to the provision where they represented as part of this agreement that they were accredited investors, which necessarily makes this, this uh, these, these securities exempt. And then as to the fraudulent inducement, we have all sorts of provisions that are gonna be in, in play. There are provisions that suggest that the plaintiffs did not rely on anything the defendants said, that they had access to all of the information that they wanted or needed, uh, clearly, that's going to be a huge part of the litigation of these, these claims. You can't litigate a case when you have the burden of proving reliance and you have stated in your contract that you, in fact, didn't rely. Uh, believe me, it's, it's clear that those uh, provisions are going to be relevant. So for those two reasons, we think that whether you call concerning about a, a narrow um, uh, construction or a broad construction, clearly a case that concerns the negotiations of a contract, a case that concerns several key provisions of the contract, concerns that agreement within any stretch of the, 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 the plain meaning of the words. I think it's important to look at the cases that they've cited um, because I think they help illustrate the proposition that I'm talking about. There are two major cases of the, the Seifert case out of the Florida Supreme Court, and then I think the Anthony case out of the Ohio court. And look at how different those cases are. In the Seifert case, the, the, the issue, it was a wrongful death claim. And the, and the plaintiff sued a home builder because the, the husband was, uh, was unfortunately killed because of carbon monoxide fumes uh, from the exhaust in, the, in the, uh, the, the garage. The Florida Supreme Court, um, said that that case, a wrongful death case, had nothing to do with the contract. And they were absolutely right. If you look at the Seifert case, you don't see any reference to the contract. You don't see any reference to the specific provisions of the contract. You don't see any reference uh, by the parties to arguments that are going to be relevant to the contract. It's just a pure wrongful death case. Yes, the parties happen to be in a relationship because of that contract, but that but-for relationship is uh, is not enough. So that's not even close to what we have here when we have a case that's all about the negotiations of the contract and all about several very important provisions of that contract. The Anthony case out of Ohio is exactly the same. That was a, 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 a rape case where um, a, an employee claimed that, that she was raped by a, a supervisor while she was employed. There, uh, She had an employment agreement that had an arbitration provision. But once again, just like in the Seifert case, that employment agreement had nothing to do with the case. Nobody was citing any provisions of that agreement. Nobody was citing any provisions or any, any facts relating to the negotiation of that agreement. Uh, the, I thought the Anthony case uh, it explained it very nicely. Arnold. 
Anthony or Arnold? You're Arnold. Arnold. You're right, Your Honor. I'm sorry. No, no. Uh, thank you, because I, I want to make sure I, I'm not losing your argument. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just misspoke. But I, I think I, I, I like the Arnold case because it sort of made the light bulb go off in my mind when I read it, because uh, the judge there said, you know, just because parties enter into a contract, if they get into an argument over the contract and one party assaults the other one, that doesn't mean that the arbitration provision applies. And I, and I thought that was a really nice way of illustrating how, uh, you know, a tort that doesn't have anything to do with the contract is not arbitrable, but that's very different from a fraudulent inducement case where many, many cases, both the United States Supreme Court and in Florida and in Ohio have said that those claims are in fact arbitrable because they relate to or are concerning the contract and case like ours where there are many uh, provisions of the contract that are absolutely relevant to the litigation of this case. So for, for those reasons, we think this litigation clearly concerns the contract and that the trial judge was wrong not to bind the parties to their agreement to arbitrate. Remember, these are very sophisticated parties here. They decided on arbitration and this court, uh, the trial court should have honored that request. And, and so we think this court should reverse. I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes on the tipsy coachman arguments. These were the arguments that were not accepted by the trial uh, judge, but they're being raised in the brief anyway. Uh, first, they argue that the agreement is not specific enough uh, because it doesn't say anything about the mechanics of arbitration. That's just not true. The agreement specifically incorporates the procedural provisions of uh, FINRA, the Financial Industry uh, Regulatory Authority, and those rules are plenty detailed. If you look at the supplemental appendix at pages six and seven, which is a table of contents of those rules, you'll see that those rules govern how arbitrators are selected, the number of arbitrators, the time limits for arguments, extensions, pre-hearing procedures, hearing procedures, and discovery. So there's lots of detail here. And even if there weren't, even if this court were to decide that the FINRA rules didn't apply, uh, Florida courts, federal courts, and Ohio courts all say that, uh, that the arbitrator can fill in the pure procedural rules. So the mechanics of the arbitration just isn't a, 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 a problem if, if, if the parties don't address it. The, the, uh, the case that we cited out of the fourth DCA uh, was, uh, you know, absolutely on point with that. That was a case where the, the, um, the parties didn't specify any rules whatsoever. The fourth DCA had no problem saying that the, the, the arbitrator can fill in the provision. And that comes right out of the statute. If you look at 682.06, it says that the arbitrator can conduct an arbitration in any matter the arbitrator deems appropriate for a fair and expeditious disposition of the, of the case. So I don't think there's any problem with the specifics of the, uh, of the procedures here. And then uh, secondly, they argue that, that it's somehow improper to, uh, to use the FINRA rules because these folks are not FINRA members and this is not a FINRA arbitration. We've never claimed that this was a FINRA arbitration. All the parties did here was borrow the rules of FINRA. They could, the parties could do anything they wanted in terms of the procedure. They could make up their own rules if they wanted to. They could borrow the rules of FINRA. They could borrow the rules of the AAA. They could borrow the rules of Major League Baseball for that matter. Uh, all that matters is the parties decided, sophisticated parties decided that these would be the rules they would use. These are rules that, that are used in securities cases all the time. So it makes absolute perfect sense. So we don't believe that either of their uh, tipsy coachman arguments uh, uh, have merit. And so uh, for all those reasons, we believe that the, uh, the trial court's opinion refusing to send this case to arbitration should be reversed. And I'll reserve the rest of my time unless there are some more questions from the panel. Attorney Lopez, you may present. Good morning. May it please the court. Lindsay Lopez on behalf of the Appalese CAC Pharma Investments LLC and C&J Healthcare Investments LLC. We are asking this court to affirm the trial court's order denying the motion to compel arbitration because the trial court properly found that there was not an arbitrable issue that was within the scope of the party's arbitration provision. Uh, Judge Casanueva, you properly pointed out that this arbitration provision and this case uh, is limited to claims concerning the investment uh, the investment agreements. And 
these claims that uh, the plaintiffs have raised do not concern the investment agreements. They are primarily statutory. Let me ask you a, a question. Since this contract um, is governed arguably by Ohio laws, I understand the language. And uh, Arnold case cites the um, Ohio Supreme Court case. What was the name of it? I should know the name. Uh, Academy of Medicine, I believe it was. And it seems by reading those cases, analytically, the first point you are to make, and I don't want to practice Ohio law without a license, except you all invited me to, um, is that you should figure out the scope of the clause in question because no one can be compelled to arbitrate something they didn't intend to arbitrate. So if I understand those rules correct, then we should go to the text of the contract? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Should look to the text of the concept, contract and, and determine whether this is a contract that's concerning uh, the agreements at issue. And I will tell you, uh, we agree that the trial court properly found that Ohio law apply, applies and the trial, trial court properly relied on the Academy of Medicine of Cincinnati case in determining that this case, uh, the claims in this case were not within the scope of that arbitration provision. I will tell you that the, the that analysis that no party can be required to arbitrate a claim that it has not agreed to arbitrate is consistent from Florida law, federal law, Ohio law. Every case that discusses arbitration certainly grounds it in the fact that it's an issue of contract interpretation. And although the um, law favors arbitration, it still needs to be within the scope of the arbitration provision. It still needs to be with, uh, consistent with the party's contract. And is so, it fair to conclude from the Ohio law is if you find an ambiguity in the language of the contract, then the public policy would serve to tip towards arbitration? Yes, Your Honor. That's consistent okay. in Florida, federal, Ohio. I'll say that the, the doubts are resolved in favor of arbitration, but still, you need to make sure that this is actually a dispute that arises from the contract and that has some contractual nexus. What the Florida Supreme Court and this court have referred to as a significant relationship. And the Academy of Medicine case also says the focus should be on whether the action could be maintained without reference to the contract at issue. And so this is the sort of analysis that the Florida Supreme Court did fairly extensively in the Seifert case. And the how can you how can you rescind a contract without referencing the contract? Because all of this, these claims seek to rescind, don't they? Your Honor, I think that the proper analysis is the analysis that the trial court conducted under the Seifert case and the uh, Verizon case, which is whether or not, well, in substance, what these claims are trying to do is to rescind the sale, the sale of the security. And the investment agreements are not the security. The interest in the Ben Therapeutics that was purchased by the plaintiffs that's the sale. They're trying, to, they're trying to get out of the agreements. I mean, they're trying, they're trying to rescind the agreements so, so that they don't have to convey. I mean, you can you can make that argument about any contract that that imposes on that imposes conditions because ultimately, why are you trying to get out of the contract? I want to get out of the conditions. I want to get out of the performance. So that 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 argument to me doesn't really doesn't really move the ball forward. They're trying to rescind the agreements because the agreements require conveyance of securities, but they're still trying to rescind the agreement. I mean, the plaintiff gets to be the master of their complaint. That's what they're that's what they're claiming. So help me out. Your, if you, I think it's helpful to look at what the claims are in this case, um, and and many of them are securities claims that are separate from the agreement, and they don't require any construction of any portion of the agreement. That's the analysis that Seifert focuses on, that this court focused on in the Verizon case. We're not suing for a breach of the investment agreements, and we're not saying that there was a breach of any portion of those or there were, and we're, we're not relying on any language of those. We're relying on obligations and duties that are um, imposed pursuant to Florida law, specifically statutory law and common law. And so, for example, the first count is seeking rescission pursuant to uh, Chapter 517, 517.211 for failure to register the securities as required by 517.07. That doesn't rely. Yeah, I, 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 I get, I get that the basis is, is something that you can. But at the, at what, what they're seeking is to, is to rescind these agreements. And I, I just don't, I don't know how you can do that without referencing the agreements in some way. I think the crux of the claims is to rescind the investments, and the agreements set forth certain, certain. Uh, so not to pile on, but just putting it 
really simply, how is an action to rescind the agreement, whether pursuant to the various statutory claims or based on fraudulent inducement, not concerning the agreement? How is an action to rescind? How does it not concern the agreement? I think it relates to the, the analysis that's set forth in the Florida cases about when you're looking at whether something concerns the agreement, the language that the Florida Supreme Court used is, at a minimum, it needs to raise some issue, the resolution of which requires reference to or construction of some portion of the contract. So this is what Judge Barbas found, which is, yes, there is a contracted issue, there's a contract between the parties, but you don't need to look at any portion of the contract. He said, uh, I, this is on the, in the appendix on page 199. I disagree with that, and I'll tell you why. In referring to the contract, you're just referring to that piece of paper. You're referring, I'll say, in essence, to the fact that a contract exists, but you're not doing what Cypher and what Verizon and all the other cases interpreting Cypher do, which is construing or determining any of those specific provisions of the contract. And so your, these are duties that exist outside the contract, the duties to register, the duties to be for the individuals who are involved to be registered with the Office of Financial Regulation. All of these things are going to, are reasons that the sale can be rescinded for reasons that are completely separate from the duties that are set forth in the contract. And so the Cypher case says you need to, if you're looking at whether or not this is something that concerns the contract and has a contractual nexus to the contract, you need to be required to reference or construe some portion of the contract. You don't need but, to do but that. I'm before. sorry. I, the nexus to the contract is that they want out of it. it that I, I don't think you can get much more uh, of a nexus than. Uh, I understand, Your Honor. I think that I would say the crux of these these claims is to get out of the sale. That the sale is the the rescinding the purchase of the security, rescinding the purchase in Ben, and that that claim could exist entirely separately from the from the contract. Even if there was no contracted issue, if they purchased a security and it didn't comply with the securities obligations, these uh, Florida law securities obligations, then you don't need to look at the contract to say this violated Florida law and it's an independent contractual duty. It arises pursuant to law and it doesn't arise pursuant to any obligations in the contract. And I do think this court's analysis in the Verizon versus um, Bateman case is actually really helpful to this. This was a case where the customer had a customer agreement with Verizon. They entered into the agreement, the duties, it had a very, very broad arbitration provision. It basically says, we agree that we're only gonna go to arbitration for small claims court. And the duties to pay the cell phone bill arose from the terms of that customer agreement. And so there was an amount that was owed under that agreement and the, uh, customer filed for bankruptcy. The bankruptcy court discharged the debt and then Verizon, for whatever reason, ended up hiring a debt collector who attempted to collect that debt. And so the debt and all the obligations between the parties clearly arose under the customer agreement, but the statutory duty, statutory duty not to collect a claim that was uh, discharged in bankruptcy arose separately. It arose separately under the consumer protection laws, Florida and federal consumer protection laws. In this court, this is a 2019 case. Let me find the language I want to point to. It says, Mr. Bateman does not allege that Verizon's conduct violated the customer agreement, and nor does he base his claims on any of the terms of the customer agreement. They basically said, although the obligation between the parties may have arisen pursuant to the customer agreement, and that's the basis for the relationship, that's not the basis for the claim. The basis for the claim is an independent statutory duty not to collect uh, not to collect debts that have been discharged in bankruptcy. And that's the same thing we're dealing with here, that these are securities violations that are independent from the obligations of the... But, the, but the, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm having a hard time making that connection because what happens in a consumer, consumer collection case is all of the alleged activities typically arise post execution of contract you're not trying to rescind the you're not trying to rescind the Verizon agreement you're not trying to go back you know to the status quo ex ante you're you're what you're saying is that there's something that has happened post execution of the agreement that although started from the agreement is independent conduct that is statutorily barred here what is being alleged whether true or not whether whether it ultimately gets proven or not 
what is being alleged is that there, there were misrepresentations, that there were requirements that weren't done such that the agreement itself needs to be rescinded. And to me, those are two categorically different kinds of claims. You're not trying, the Verizon case has nothing to do with rescind, rescinding the Verizon agreement. This case does. I, I understand, Your Honor. I understand the distinction you're making. I would just say that the it, the crux of what the complaint is trying to do is to set aside the sale, which is a, its statutory right to set aside the sale, and that it arises from completely separate statutory duties. And so, for example, I know that Mr. Brannick argued that there's certain things in the contract that are going to be relevant to determining whether or not the um, whether or not these exemptions apply or whether or not certain fraud claims can apply and those sorts of things. I would just say that those are the sorts of things that are, there's a whole body of law that touches on the issue of whether or not you are an exempt offering, whether or not this qualifies as an exempt offering, whether or not this is something that these these individuals could qualify as accredited investors and you don't determine that from looking at the language of the contract. The, the fact that they said that this was an exempt offering is not determinative, determinative of those issues. The questions as to whether or not these um, agreements or th these investments can be rescinded relates to um, obligations that are separate from the contract. You don't need to construe the contract in order to resolve those issues. And then I would just say separately, we do think there's an independent basis to um, affirm the order denying the motion to compel arbitration. We think that this court and multiple other Florida courts have, have spoken to the fact that arbitration agreements need to contain essential terms. We recognize, first of all, that this is, an, this, uh, is governed by Ohio law. We recognize, of course, that Florida law, Ohio law, federal law do have certain gap fillers. The issue that we have in this case is the Ohio statute that would apply says basically, so this is the Ohio statute, 2711.04, and it says, if the, if the arbitration agreement, if in the arbitration agreement, provision is made for a method of naming or appointing an arbitrator or an umpire, that such method shall be followed. In this case, the arbitration provision points to the FINRA rules, but there is not one set of FINRA rules. There are two sets of FINRA rules, and they are different as to some of the essential terms of the agreement. So, for example, there are significant portions of the just find the section in the record to point you to. The customer code, and um, if you look at uh, Supplemental Appendix 31 through 36, and you compare it to the Supplemental Appendix 94 to 98, those are the different methods to select arbitrators under the industry code and the customer code. And for example, under the industry for industry disputes, the arbitrators are primarily non-public arbitrators, which means that they are arbitrators who have experience in the securities industry. For customer disputes, the arbitrators traders are primarily public arbitrators, which are people who do not have the relevant experience in the in the securities industry. This case doesn't fall within either of those codes. Just on its face, it doesn't involve and then remember. Or the plaintiffs are not been members. They're not associated persons. It's not a dispute with the customer. Let's 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 assume let's assume you're you're correct. Let's assume that's true. That there's just this irreconcilable ambiguity that you're never going to figure out under the federal rules. Do, do the Ohio statutes? And again, although I have family in Ohio, I don't pretend to know the law up there. But do the Ohio statutes contain any kind of provision for picking arbitrators? They do, Your Honor. They do, Your Honor. Okay, so why? Say, like, let's say you're right. Let's say that. Let's say the argument is. We can't figure out how to pick arbitrators under FINRA. Okay, well, then we just, there's a gap filler. We've got an Ohio statute that tells you how to pick arbitrators. Use the statute. Why, why doesn't that fix the problem? I would just say that the Ohio statute says first you need to look for what the arbitration agreement says. and the Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, that, that goes without saying, but, but what you're saying is, well, we look to there and it's not really clear. Okay, well, use it as a stopgap. You, you, you got to pick an arbitrator to have an arbitration. There's a statute that tells you how to do it. If FINRA doesn't, does, if you can't use FINRA, you use the Ohio statute as a stopgap, which is the whole point of the case law that says you can use the, you can use the statutory law as a filler. I would just say that this contains, because of the conflict between the two sets of federal rules, it's an inherent ambiguity as to the essential terms, some of the terms that this court and has said are essential terms to the arbitration agreement. So there's no agreement as to this essential term. This is an inherent conflict in that situation. And so there was never an agreement reached as to at least one essential term of the arbitration agreement. And the problems like that are sort of 
inherent throughout the idea of trying to use defender rules because they are clearly designed to be a FINRA arbitration. There are so many things that you can't do under the FINRA rules if you were trying to have a, your own separate arbitration. We, we pointed out at length that there's a director of FINRA, FINRA regulation that has almost all administrative duties under it. You can't just... So, you know, the same The same is true for AAA, though. I mean, if you if you read through the AAA rules, there, there's reams of stuff about how cases get processed under AAA. But that doesn't mean you can't hold it. You can't use AAA rules through a private arbitration. People do that all the time. I would just say that these these general rules also say specifically what types of uh, what types of disputes can be uh, arbitrated under FINRA. And I say if you're pointing to the FINRA rules, then you need to look at the scope of those FINRA rules. And if the dispute at issue is not within the scope of these FINRA rules, which I think it's undisputed that this one is not, then it's not subject to arbitration because the arbitration provision incorporates the FINRA rules. FINRA tells you what can be arbitrated, and this is not an arbitrable issue because it's not arbitrable under the FINRA rules. Thank you. back over my notes quickly. So I just reiterate that we believe that this is a situation very analogous to the this court's opinion in Verizon, to the analysis in Cypher, if not the specific factual situation, where you are dealing with a situation where the Duties at issue do not arise from the contract. They arise completely separately under Florida law. You do not need to construe the portions, the provisions of the contract to resolve these securities claims. And you do not need to resolve or rely on any portion of the contract in order to reach the issue of whether or not these are um, subject to being, these, these investments are subject to being rescinded or set aside under the Florida statutory scheme. And so for those reasons and the reasons set forth in our brief, unless anyone has any additional questions, we would ask the court to affirm the uh, order denying the motion to compel arbitration. Thank you, counsel. Counsel, you have five minutes remaining. Thank you, Your Honor. So let's go back to CFER. CFER tells us that uh, a claim like this is arbitrable if it has a, quote, significant relationship, close quote, to the contract. That starts me out with the same common sense argument I began with uh, and that Judge uh, Lucas and, and uh, Judge Labrick were saying, how can an argument that you need to rescind this contract not have a significant relationship to the contract? Then you look at Seaport and it says that if the, if the litigation of the claim is going to require some sort of reference to or require some sort of construction of the contract, then it's arbitrable. And I talked extensively in my uh, opening presentation and in the brief about all of the provisions in the contract that are clearly going to be referenced. In fact, are going to be front and center in this litigation. The defense is going to be pounding on the fact that the defendants, uh, that, the, that the plaintiffs conceded that they were accredited investors. And they're going to be pounding on the fact that the defendants, or the plaintiffs conceded that they, in fact, had all the information that they needed and they didn't rely. How in the world are they going to win a reliance case and a rescission uh, with, in the face of those contra contractual provisions? You know, they may have arguments around them, but the, the point is they're going to be absolutely relevant. And I, I think that brings me to the MP case, which is the, the brand new case out of the third DCA that we cited as supplemental authority because it's a, a perfect demonstration of how these principles are, are applied. That was a, uh, a, a plastic surgeon uh, and a patient relationship. Uh, the, uh, the contract that the parties signed had a broad arbitration provision. Actually, it actually had a narrower arbitration provision than the one that we have here. It just said that arising out of the contract, it didn't have the related to language. And the contract said that uh, the, the, the doctor would be taking photographs of the patient and that those photographs would in fact be, be, uh, be posted. Um, and so uh, the, the, the third DCA found that those claims were arbitrable but, uh, when, when she brought uh, tort claims for uh, uh, conversion of, uh, uh, for appropriation of her likeness. The, the court found that those claims were arbitrable because it was clear that those provisions in the contract that talked about what the doctor was allowed to do and the relationship between the parties were going to be uh, relevant to the litigation of the contract. It didn't matter that those were going to be defense matters as opposed to plaintiff matters. The question is, are they going to be relevant to the, the, the resolution of the dispute? Clearly, the provisions of the contract are going to be relevant to the, 
the resolution of this dispute. As to the, the FINRA rules, again, the only thing that was borrowed here was were the, the FINRA procedural rules. The parties agreed to the scope of the arbitration. They agreed that the arbit arbitration would be over any issues that, uh, that concerned or arose out of the out of the, the contract. That's the scope provision. Then they just borrowed the procedural rules from uh, from FINRA, and they could have borrowed again any procedural rules. So there was no borrowing of the scope provision here. So this contract had the essential term. It had the essential term, which was what did the parties agree to uh, uh, to, uh, to to arbitrate. Uh, so we don't think there's any problem in applying the FINRA rules. So for all of those reasons, we think the trial court erred in refusing to send this case to arbitration. Thank you, counsel. I see no further questions. So I will conclude that concludes this argument. We thank you for your excellent presentation for both of you. Appreciate your arguments and the effort you put forth herein. And uh, we will let you uh, exit this electronic uh, forum and bring on the final case of uh, our today.